Yahoo. I don't know what to do with that. Welcome to Wild True, the podcast of your wildest memes. We're your one-stop internet culture shop here to dissect what's going viral, why we care, and how this might affect our real human lives. I'm infected with brain worms, Isabel. And I'm personally victimized by Aaron Nola, Amanda. Anyone could be <laughs> famous on the internet, so why not us? That was an intro for like five people. That was, a, yeah, I, I also didn't understand it. So, Aaron Nola is a pitcher for the Major League Baseball team, the Philadelphia Phillies, based in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Aaron Nola, uh, bad game. Um, for context, we were going to record after the Phillies game, and then in the eighth inning, I'm just like, you know what, Isabella, let's just do it now. It's fine. I don't need to see the rest of this. No one should see this. Contextually, Amanda is wearing a Phillies shirt during this record as oh, well. Oh, I think, I think this is my 69 nice one. Oh, yes, it is. Incredible. Yeah, I do have, like, a custom Phillies t-shirt where, in theory, you're supposed to, like, put your own name on it, and it's like, whoa, I'm a Phillies player. But instead, I made the the jersey number 69 and the name Nice. That's so good. And then for my birthday, a friend got me the same shirt because they didn't know I had this shirt. But, like, it doesn't have 69 Nice on it. It's just the same front. So now I have two of these shirts, and one of them says 69 Nice, and one of them doesn't. This kind of sounds like something that would happen to you. I like how we started talking about sports when I was when I pitched this as, like, Amanda, I'm going to talk about, about a bunch of nerd shit. Yeah, well, that's why I have to talk about sports on this episode. Right, exactly. So that we can keep our jock nerd balance, um, you know, our humors balanced, if you will. Okay, actually, can I tell you a few things about the Phillies? I, I feel like you really want to, so uh, yeah, sure, I'll allow it. You know, we need to balance those humors. Okay, so there's this pitcher. His name is Jose Alvarado. Sometimes in the dugout, he uses towels to make turkeys out of towels. And last week, he started stringing some beads together, and he made a bunch of necklaces. Is this what sports is like? Is this what people are doing in sports? Yeah, and then now a bunch of guys on the Phillies are wearing their necklaces. I mean, that's adorable, but, like, this is sports? Is this what they've been fucking doing in sports the entire time? I think this is the cure to um, male loneliness. (laughs) Okay. You said that so earnestly. Uh, Shout out to uh, Raphael, a ninth grader in uh, Massachusetts who just made the golf team at his high school. Um, That is my friend's little brother. But in discussing this, my friend mentioned that in high school golf, because the kids are too young to drive golf carts, they have to just like walk from hole to hole. And then another friend pointed out that maybe this is just how you get men to get in the habit of going on walks with their friends and talking and that golf really is the cure to male loneliness no dude i you're actually like 100 percent right like i'm pretty sure that's literally the the reason for golf is for like guys to just go like hang out on a lawn together yeah but i think that the phillies are really exemplifying um non-toxic male friendship where he made them necklaces and they're wearing them necklaces say things or do they just have beads on them They're like shiny red, white, and blue beads because those are the Phillies colors. Pretty good. You know what else is a cure to male loneliness? Baldur's Gate 3. Playing a lot of video games and never talking to anybody. (laughs) Yeah. Maybe Discord is the cure to male loneliness because men do be on Discord discording their friends. I, You know, honestly, like you say this, but most of the people I Discord are like weird queer people who are like mostly fem aligning. See, that's just, like, who I hang out with generally, so I'm like, is that just my own social circles, or, you know? I think I think Discord is for every single gender at the same time. You have to pick all of them to get on there. I've lost the plot on what I was going to say. Oh, but I did say that the theme for this episode is things that were started in 1996. Like both of us. Like both of us. <laughs> Yeah, so the studio that started Baldur's Gate 3, um, that made Baldur's Gate 3, was started in 1996, and One Piece also started in 1996, and we were both, I was going to say created, but I was not created in 1996. I feel like technically we were both created in 1995, if if we want to get really technical about it. (laughs) Do you ever think about, like, how you can kind of, like, reverse engineer what date you were created on? I was early, because I was impatient. Well, I can't help you there, then. (laughs) 
I'm pretty sure I, that I could like just ask my parents and they would know because I was created in a test tube. Yeah, that's probably like more deliberate than as far as I know, I was not created in a test tube. Have you ever asked? I mean, I feel like it would have come up. I don't know, man. You know, you know, you know, dads love to drop lore at the most in- inopportune times. <laughs> Does your dad do that? Yeah, once in a while. I mean, not this. This I've known since I was like a child. Okay. Well, speaking of lore, um, there's probably lore in Baldur's Gate 3, Yo, actually, a thing that you wanted to talk about. Actually, there really isn't that much lore. Oh, anyway, I just wanted to talk about Baldur's Gate 3 because um, yeah. it's it's simply video game about D&D, which felt like something we should talk about. And also because I think it's an interesting arc that people are having with this game in their relationship to um, Larian Studios. Because, so... First of all, Baldur's Gate 3 is technically the third... I was going to say threequel, and that's not actually a word. But, you know, it's the threequel to um, Baldur's Gate 2 and Baldur's Gate 1, except it is basically a standalone. Because the original Baldur's Gate games are from 1998 and, like, the early 2000s, and then there were a bunch of other stuff, like Planescape Torment, blah, 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 that were created in using the D&D IP. So, Baldur's Gate 3 was came out, like... I want to say like a month ago now, and it's just releasing for the PlayStation in like a couple of days, or it will have already happened by the time you're listening to this. Um, and it immediately, people people were fucking loving this. Well, first of all, you need a really good computer to run this, which is very annoying. Um, I did buy a computer. Was it for this? Was it for this specifically? Maybe so. I'll never say. Yeah, I unfortunately have not played because the best computer I have is my Yahoo-issued MacBook Pro 16-inch, and Macs famously are not PCs, and also I feel like, you know... You shouldn't do that on your Yahoo, Yahoo computer. Issued I feel like that's laptop. a bad idea, yeah. Just a bit. I will say that I don't think it's a video game you would super like, so I don't think you're missing anything. Have I said, have I said on the podcast that in Yahoo orientation, they make you yodel? I think you did because I do remember the yodeling, you mentioning yodeling and me being like incredulous about it. Yeah. Well, yeah. by make by make you, I mean that the HR person's like, what if we all do a yodel together? Because they do like group orientations on Zoom. Mm-hmm. And then everyone's like, I am not unmuting. I refuse. And I thought that was just my orientation, but like multiple people have told me this. Um, anyway, uh, Yahoo, a company that exists that I work for. Do you think that's like a like a reverse psychology thing where they're trying to get you to like bond against the HR person asking you to yodel? <laughs> I don't know because like through adversity, I don't you know, you're going through a tra- any of the- traumatic experience together. Is this like hazing, like fraternity? Yeah, exactly. Hazing? Except it's like yodeling in Yahoo. Yahoo. I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> Baldur's Gate three. No, I mean, so that's. I completely lost my train of thought by you You look so troubled. Um, I think we were talking about how you need a good computer to play it, and you may or may not have gotten a gaming PC to play Baldur's Gate 3. Yeah, okay, so that's actually, that was also a tangent to what I actually wanted to talk about, which is that there, there's two things that I wanted to talk about here. The first is that, what I think is interesting is that Wizards, first of all, Baldur's Gate 3 is doing really well. People are fucking loving it. People are going ape shit for creating a little guy and making him run around. And then, you know, fuck all the companions. Um, this is yeah, the most important part. Yeah, all I part. know about this game is that it's basically D&D is a video game, and also that you can be a bear who fucks a vampire, and also that there is apparently racism in it and people are mad about it, but I don't know what the thing was. I just saw people being mad on Twitter and was like, I haven't played this game, so I don't know what you're talking about. So these are all true things. So address the fantasy racism point first. Um, The racism is against the tieflings, which is like, so like, it's like fantasy racism, but it's also kind of like people were talking about it in the context of real racism. Um, And then, then you get into should i do like a game review first should we should i put on my game review gamer hat and then tell our listeners whether they should play baldur's gate 3 or not before i actually get into criticism i just want to know like how how are you doing how is it how are you enjoying baldur's gate what's your character like by it because this is the this is the perfect blend of um dating sim um and 
like <laughs> crunchy number bullshit, like doing like tactical shit, replaying this fight four times in a row after getting TPK. This is why I think you would hate it because it's a lot of like, honestly, if you play it, in a, you don't have to play it this way, but it does have a lot of D&D combat and like crunchy bullshit that I feel like you would just be like, why am I doing this crunchy bullshit? Yeah. So the thing that I realized is that I was having a lot of angst about D&D combat and then I realized it was just because... I was a low-leveled warlock, and all I could do was Eldritch Blast, so I was just doing Eldritch Blast, and then waiting, like, 20 minutes, and then doing it again, and then you roll and you miss, and you're like, well... Yeah, but, like, the thing is, like, you're, you're starting from level one in, in Baldur's Gate, so you do have to go through, like, the, the bullshit, like, low-level stuff. Oh, yeah, no. I, I feel like D&D combat, the enjoyment that I get out of combat is directly proportional to like what level the character is because if you have more choices of what to do then like you have stuff to think about while everybody else is doing their turn but if you're just gonna eldritch blast over and over again because that's like your only thing you can do then no it's and, and really this, this goes back to my um my opinion that you should start all campaigns at level three that that's my hot take yeah. that's my hot, hot D take of the night I do think that's true, and I don't think I've ever started a campaign where we were See, that's level crazy, three. because I've started level one before, and, like, that's just annoying as shit. Um, Aaron is actually a big Damn. believer in starting at level one, and I think um, he's fucking deranged for that. Of course he is. <laughs> <laughs> I f- Damn, okay. <laughs> I feel like he's someone that would really enjoy, like, you know, when you're level 10, you're going to look back at when you were level one. <laughs> And you're just gonna feel the nostalgia for the journey. You know, I I don't. God, I don't I look like back at level D&D one. D and D really brings out D and D brings out everybody's worst traits. It's honestly like your speed running friendship problems, if that makes sense. And that that's the one thing that Baldur's Gate oh, doesn't yeah. have. This is actually what I miss. No, I'm dead serious. <laughs> this is kind of what I miss in Baldur's Gate. Is that like in Baldur's Gate, if I want to commit a- atrocities or if I want to kill a guy, I just go ahead and do it. And I think to myself in my head damn, I just killed a guy. Damn, I just killed the whole goblin camp. But then I can kind of dismiss it. I can move on with it. If I play D&D in real life, every single time we try to do atrocities or we don't do atrocities or anyone gets any sort of magic item or any anyone says something stupid, it's like a 40-minute detour into an ethical like discussion or like just like 15 memes stacked on top of each other. And that's what you don't get in Baldur's Gate 3. You're not getting... um you're not getting the the 40 minute bullshit session that comes just like you know free free with purchase you're not getting the the sensation of being like i'm kind of annoyed with uh, i'm just doing an example of someone in my party this is not personal you're like i'm annoyed with barry the character but am i annoyed with zoe the human like you don't get that but you also don't barry's a great character though (laughs) okay you, you know when um friend who was a former theater kid is playing a bard who is actually, like, really unsuccessful in acting but thinks he's better than everyone and just goes like, ha ha, it is me, Barry. I think that's maybe a you-specific experience, but yeah, sure, let's go with it. Um, some uh, noted uh, friends of the pod are anti-bard, but I think if you play it that way, it's really funny. I'm, I'm pro-bard. Because I think Bard is one of just those classes that you have to extremely ham it up. Like, you, you're there you're there as a personality hire, and you do have to lean into that. But what I was going to say is that the other thing that you don't have is you don't have, like, a five-year-long joke about underwear with friends on the ass. And, like, that's what's missing from Baldur's Gate. Because Baldur's Gate is very much just, like, you're playing, like, D&D. You're playing, like, <laughs> you're in the Forgotten Realms. It's, it is also incredibly fun, though. Like, it is a good game. If your computer can run it, I would definitely buy it. That being said... I think there's an interesting arc that's happening right now with Baldur's Gate 3 where the beginning is super polished and it is and the, by the beginning I mean the first like 20 something hours is super polished uh. and the first like two thirds of it is super good and then apparently the end is quite buggy but like not but then here's the interesting part people don't get to the end uh, for like a while so all the reviews are really good. <laughs> and I mm. just think that's a really interesting problem to have. And I mean, it, 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 I mean, it's part of the larger problem of people shipping games that are not finished because they can just do that. And that's just part of the landscape of um, video gaming now. Um, and this is all, by the way, this is all heresy, right? Because I haven't gotten to the end game of Baldur's Gate 3. <laughs> 
So it's like mm. there's there's little literally a problem here where it's like okay, so like is the ending bad? I don't know. We haven't gotten to it, but because the beginning is good, it's getting good reviews. And then there's been kind of like a hero villain arc that Larian Studios has been on where it's like people were really into them for a while and then a couple of people were like, "Hey, they keep shipping games that the ending are like not great." And then people are starting to get to the end and they're like, oh, this ending was actually very disappointing. And then people are like, and now it's like, oh, is Larian Studios a villain? Anyway, we should stop like parasocialing with video game studios. That's my hot take on that. Yeah, another uh, take I've seen floating around about Baldur's Gate was there was an article in Polygon that someone was like, playing Baldur's Gate made me better at playing D&D because now I understand yes. how spell slots and did bonus you see, actions work. Did you see that from Eric's tweet? Because I saw that from Eric's tweet and I lost my fucking mind. Yes, and then also the author, I think, went to my middle school. No shade at her. Like, I just feel like if you play D&D and you don't know what a bonus action is, that's on your DM. I just feel like you should know what a spell slot is if you've been playing for more than a month. Like, I'm sorry. Yeah, like, whoever the author's DM is needs to, like, have a good hard look in the mirror and be like, why did I not explain the rules of the game to Yeah, okay, players? so for context, we're talking about a Polygon article where the author basically shows, like, incredible lack of basic knowledge at Dungeons & Dragons in a way where it's clear that nobody ever really taught them this. And it's like, first of all, at some point you should probably read the the book, Um I will say that, like, a lot of people just don't. But the second thing is that, like, what is your DM doing? Oh, I've never read the D&D book. It, it, there's a player's handbook. Do you want a digital copy? I'll send it to you. No, yeah, but I thought that I thought that the player's handbook is just, like, here's what all the spells are. No, it explains the game. Oh, well, I mean, I know how to play, but, like... I've, it's... <laughs> should I read the player's handbook? I mean, you're just supposed to read the player's handbook before you start, like, playing. I'm not going to get on your ass about it, because, like, I mean, if you know how to play, it's fine. It's just, like, the, the rules are there, man. Yeah, well, I, w- I was told what a bonus action was, so... I mean, I just think that, like, you know, if you have, two, if you have like, two hours to kill, like, read the player's handbook. But if you read the player's handbook, do you get to count it as one of your book-a-days? Um, if I did that, yes, I would be able Hell to yeah. do that. It is technically a book that is published. <laughs> See, see, this conversation is really like the experience of playing Baldur's Gate, where you get um, sidetracked into many other smaller conversations that will some somehow lead you back to the original one. This is also the experience of us trying to make content at 10.30 p.m. when we both are um, experiencing life. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to be real. It, was, it wasn't going to be better if we recorded it in the morning. Like, it was probably actively going to be worse, um, which is why I was like, let's just do it now. Oh, the other thing I wanted to talk about is because we've been talking a lot about Wizards of the Coast recently, I feel like. And I just wanted to highlight the fact that, like, we talk about the licensed media being pretty good, like the D&D movie, Baldur's Gate 3 being good. But then we, when we actually talk about Wizards of the Coast, the last time we talked about them, it was like Pinkerton's related. And I just want to know what they're doing with their company. <laughs> I still like, what's going can't on believe here? the Pinkertons thing happened. I just want to see what Wizards is doing. You know, I just want to see what they're doing. Culture is so fundamentally backwards right now that insane things like Wizards of the Coast sending the Pinkertons to a vlogger's house is, like, not that big of news. Like, I'm still stuck on when Kanye West decided that he doesn't hate Jews anymore because he watched 21 Jump Street and was like, Jonah Hill's funny. That's a really Kanye move. Like, <sighs> you know, hey, remember when the guy said that there were, that the guy in the government said there were aliens and we all just ignored yeah. that? Sometimes I think yeah. about that. Like, why did we all ignore that? Like, why didn't we at least make some memes My about it? My pottery teacher was talking about that because in, in our pottery class, we just kind of are like, so did you see that weird thing in the news this week? Which is how adults talk to each other, apparently. Yeah, that is how adults talk to each other. Trump mugshot. That was weird. We don't really need to talk about that because there's nothing to say, but, like, that was weird. Um, yeah. So. No, I, wait, we do need to talk about a Trump mugshot because I I think the Trump mugshot, okay, the Trump mugshot and the Trump website based on the Trump mugshot that he made to post his mugshot to get money, um, I think this is all really, like, lending a proof to my theory that Trump was supposed to buy Twitter and Elon was supposed to run for president. And if those two things had just been switched, we would be in the good timeline. I stand by that 100%. I think both of those things happening would be bad, though. No, but, like, it'd be, they, they'd be bad, but they'd be sensible. Also, 
Like the guy, like why did the guy who was bad at posting buy Twitter instead of the guy who was good at posting? You <laughs> have to admit, Trump was an incredible poster. Say what you want about Trump. The man knows how to post. Um. <laughs> the man knows how to post. He's like, you know, he's evil. But he's good at posting. He is good at po- like, yeah. But also, yes, um, we are aware that Elon Musk is not able to run for president of the United States. I just can't wait for, like, the art history paper that's going to be written in, like, 20 years about the Trump mugshot as art. Also... Ooh, what do you think the comparisons will be? Like, you know, let's say that this is an art history p- paper. What's the co- what's the context in which the... I feel like the this... You might get some, like, this is not a pipe. Oh, my God. I mean... Of it all. What really strikes me in the mugshot is the lighting. Is that you know that you're just in, like, a municipal building that has bad fluorescent lighting. The camera they're using is probably just a random digital camera. And, like, when you look at the mugshots from the other people that were indicted, some of them are so overexposed, like... The photography is just not good. And then so with Trump's, like, they did get the exposure better, but it still was a little overexposed. And the the light and the shadows and how all that interacts makes it look as though the, the swoop of his hair is his eyebrows. So it makes him look even angrier. But then when you see his actual yeah. eyebrows, his actual eyebrows are pretty angry. But, like... It reminds me of the Bowser mini game, or no, it wasn't Bowser. It was like Mario, but in Mario Party, where you have to do like the face lifting things to match the picture. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Also, I do want to brag for a second that I am cited on the Wikipedia page for Donald Trump's mugshot. <laughs> I was quite literally like, you know, when you're like on the toilet and you're looking at your phone because you're a millennial. And I was at my friend's house doing this, and I saw that Depths of Wikipedia posted a whole thing about, like, behind the scenes of Wikipedia and how we got the Trump mugshot page up so quickly. And I had written about the mugshot, as one does, and then I was like, let me check and see if I'm cited on this. I'm probably not, but wouldn't that be real funny? And then I found out, and then I, and then I came out of the bathroom, and I was like, hey, guys, guess what? Yeah, I feel like you're cited on very random wikipedia articles <laughs> it's like club penguin <laughs> like club penguin tumblr Donald trump's mugshot probably a bunch of random tech companies um raul ligma i'm on the raul ligma wikipedia page right yes oh wait speaking of tumblr tumblr has done the most unhinged marketing campaign probably because they were paid a lot of money something and, okay, I'm going to pose that to you, Amanda. Let's say you are Tumblr. You have been given many dollars to advertise a live-action adaption of a beloved pirate manga. This ma- manga slash anime is literally, A, the best-selling <laughs> manga in the world, like, in oh, history. No. It has a bunch of fans on Tumblr already. And it is still ongoing, um, and you are basically being told, hello, I must advertise it. There are many beloved characters that we could put here. We could, like, do something with, and you have free reign to, like, do whatever to the site. How would you advertise the show on Tumblr? Um, given that it's Tumblr, thinking about our audience here, I feel like you gotta do something where, like... Maybe you take, like, a beloved character's face and then do the crabs thing, except it's the guy's face. See, that's actually pretty close to what they did, except what they did was 5,000 times worse. They simply put a goddamn clown on the dash. I'm going to send you a screenshot. I also don't know anything about One Piece, except that they're searching for the One Piece, I believe. Yes, they are searching for One Piece. Oh, no, I hate that. Like, look at I hate that. (laughs) I don't like that. (laughs) <laughs> sorry <laughs> that's exactly the reaction i was hoping you'd have who is this <laughs> crouching why is okay, he des- crouching describe this for our audience describe this des- okay. describe this for our audience there is a person who is like 
on top of a barrel, but like crouched on it in a way that I'm kind of impressed with their balance. Um, they're wearing a red clown nose and clown makeup and a pirate hat that is orange and has blue streamers coming out of either side. And also a puffy beige coat. It is on the side of the Tumblr dashboard and it is quite unsettling. Yeah, so basically Tumblr just added a clown to everybody's dash and you couldn't get rid of him. <laughs> it's just a PNG of this fucking Wait, clown so you can't... on the side of your dash. You can't? You couldn't get rid of it. You can if you like do like the inspect element and like make it so that you can't see it. And you can also replace it with other stuff. <laughs> but by default, if you were on desktop, there was simply a clown pirate <laughs> crouching like, like Gollum-like <laughs> on this barrel <laughs> staring at I you. I don't like it. For like a day. And every, everyone fucking hated it. I thought it was good. I thought this was the most hysterical thing they could have done. I think it's funny, but I don't like it. Like, I, it sucks so bad. Um, and for context for people who read One Piece slash watch One Piece, this is Buggy. Of course they fucking put Buggy there. This is actually very in character. Um, so this was just part of Tumblr's um, like One piece -ification where there was like a week where you just had like a tab that would go through different characters and then they simply clowned us and it sucked shit. They have clowned us again today, but it's been like less clown energies. It's been like a different sort of clown. They just had like a little logo instead of like the man here crouching. <laughs> um, and that's, that's what I wanted to talk about. That's what I wanted to show you. I thought that was really relevant. Like Damn, I really wish podcasting was a visual medium right now. Also, okay. You really have to see this yeah. to believe it. So, again, I don't know a lot about One Piece. This is the Isabel Explains Things to Me episode. However, in our Discord, plug for our Discord, which you can join if you subscribe to our Patreon, patreon.com slash wowftrue, um, Andromeda was like, is Tumblr crossing the picket line? And I just saw that message and I was like, I'm sure that they have a good point and that they're raising a good question. But I just need to sit for a second with the, uh, just the fact of, did Tumblr cross the picket line is just, none of these words are in the Bible. <laughs> yeah, that's like a lot conceptually. Mm -hmm. That's a lot conceptually to deal with. Also, Tumblr was not crossing the picket line. Like, it can't do that. Yeah, I think, unfortunately, this is my bad Republican take. I think Tumblr just needs to take money that they can get. Tumblr has, like, no money. They're losing so much money every year. I wrote about this, and I don't remember the figure, but I think they're losing something like $200 million a year. Don't quote me. Um, should I fact check this? Uh, okay. How much money is Tumblr losing per year? Oh, okay. Um, $30 million. Cool. Um, oh, it's, it's, it's more. No, I Delightful. said 200 but... Um, oh, it's but less. yeah, 30 million they're losing each year. That's fact checking, baby. Is it bad that I think that's like basically pocket change? Well, I think that for tech companies it is, but yeah. like, so it's also like... when you're a tech company that's existed for like 15 years, maybe at this point, you kind of want to be making money and you kind of want to be getting more users and they're doing neither of those things. Well, see, I kind of think that putting a clown on everyone's <laughs> dashboard is actually going to do the opposite of get new users. I think that, like, like, bro, imagine, like, creating a Tumblr, and the first day that you're on Tumblr, there's a clown. <laughs> I would fucking leave. I feel like they probably got a good amount of money from Netflix for that, though. Also, why did they make a live-action One Piece? See, that's, that's the other thing I want to talk about. This is an insane choice. Okay, so, live-action One Piece is on Netflix. One Piece, contextually, is a manga and anime, an animanga, um, that's, that's nothing, but the manga has, um, 1,058 chapters, it was started in 1996, it has been going consistently, consistently since 1996, it is the most popular anime and manga in the world, I cannot stress this enough, this is actually a big deal in anywhere that's not the US. Yeah, I feel like this is similar to, like, how people in the U.S. engage with soccer. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is that it's got 1,074 episodes, give or take, of the anime. It, it is long as shit. And you know who's adapting this? It's Netflix. Cancel everything after two seasons, Netflix. <laughs> and, like, every single anime adaption has been garbage Netflix. So 
there's a lot of baffling decisions that made that went into this being created. It's like eight episodes. Um, it came out a couple days ago now, and it is honestly right now, as of today, it is the number one series on Netflix in over fifty countries. This this is what happens when you are the best selling manga in the world, right? And I am here to say, heartbreakingly, it's really good. Unfortunately, it's I really mean, I'm good. I'm glad that it's good. Unfortunately, kind of fucks That's and vibes. It's probably better than it not being good. It shouldn't have been good. Why does this exist? But I do think that, like, what it does well is that it actually, it had a ton of creator input. Like, aggressive amounts of creator input. Because when you're the creator of the best-selling manga in the world, you could have as much creator input as you want, I fucking guess. And also, it does, it translates, like, manga bullshit to live-action bullshit very effectively even though it's, like, the silliest sort of story. Um, I actually recommend it regardless of whether you're a One Piece fan or not, but I do think that the fact that it exists is baffling, and some of the marketing decisions are also baffling. I, I only mean the clown. Everything else is fine, but, like, wh- why is so he here? Can you tell me about, is One Piece, is this just a thing that I've heard, or is it true that One Piece is about finding the One Piece? Yeah, no, it's about finding the One Piece. Do you think they're ever gonna? yeah. No, I, I think they're actually going to find the One Piece at the end. I feel like it's been building up for 20 years to, like, no, sorry, 27 years to God. get to the end of they're going to find the One Piece because it's very much, do you, do you want me to, like, fucking recap One Piece for you? I'll do it. This, I've been following this bullshit since I was 12. Not really because it seems like a lot's happening and it seems like there's a lot of One Piece. I just, I don't know. I am fascinated by the No, it's very simple. It's, simple. Ro- it's, okay. it's about the dumbest man in the world who has a rubber body. He's the, he's the dumbest fucker in the world. Is it he's like a, the Odyssey? And I, is what? it like the Odyssey? No, because it's it's like, it's just like it's it's more like just the way that like anime just keeps happening. Yeah, I guess it's like like comic books keep happening. Yeah, it's like comic books keep happening, but it is a single continuity. But it is about the dumbest man in the world who has eaten the the rub, the gum gum fruit, and is now a man made out of rubber, who is simply going to become the pirate king. Everything else stems from that. And to become the Pirate King, you must find the One Piece, which is the treasure that the previous Pirate King hid on an island that you need to go find. D- does, that, does that help? Yeah. Now, now, here's how the clown fits into okay. it. The clown is simply there. <laughs> okay, no, I'll actually explain the clown. The clown is an early, and like an early season antagonist who simply keeps showing up and failing upwards. So, in some ways, we are plagued by the clown in the manga, in the same way that the Tumblr dashboard is plagued by the clown. In that case, brilliant, brilliant work. Like, I guess, it, man, the problem is that, like, I'm looking at him now. And it's really distracting because he's, <laughs> he's just Discord there. chat. He's just there. <laughs> he's just on book. I think the problem is that, like, his, I kind of feel like it's one of those pictures where the eyes follow you. <laughs> it is. <sighs> oh, God. Anyway, I don't think we can draw any conclusions from this other than the fact that, like, People should mark it differently and not do this. However, we are talking about it. I do find it fascinating when you have serialized media and you have to keep making it because capitalism and because you want to make that sweet, sweet dough. But then, like, the story. So then you end up with 1,074 episodes of something. I'm going to be real. I'm going to be real. I think he's in this for the love of the game. I think this is 100% like authentic desire to make this but bullshit. Like, how do you choose when to end it? Like when do you think One Piece will end? Like what per He's going to end when he finds the One Piece. <laughs> what per what I'm, percentage I'm dead serious. through the story do you think we are? Oh, we're about 80% now. I would say this is going to end up, it's going to wrap up in the next 4 years. Damn. No, I'm like dead serious about this. Like compared to every other anime and manga that I've like read, like any like, long-running ones, this is actually very much working towards a conclusion, and it has been working toward a conclusion for about 50% of the situation. Where it's like, you can, you can tell how everything is going to start um, layering up upon itself to be endgame, and I think it's actually going to be really okay. good. Sorry, I, like, I'm, I, I'm not a hater on this one. This is one of the only pieces of media I unironically enjoy. Like Homestuck. No, I ironically enjoy that. Homestuck was very <laughs> bad, despite the fact that it was very good. One Piece is actually very good. One piece is about friendship, the clown being there, um, fighting your enemies, um, being a pirate, <laughs> and again, the friends you made along the way. Well, that sounds like uh, one uh, 
pieces of one whole, if you will. Buddy, that was nothing. <laughs> That's okay. I feel like, is it bad if I'm like, this is a good segue into Jimmy Buffett having died? <laughs> Jimmy Buffett has it's pirate a fucked vibes. fucked up thing to say, right? Right, like he has pirate vibes. He has clown vibes. I can't say that, he's dead. Yeah. Um, oh, I did want to just talk about, to, to tie it all together, I just wanted to talk about, the only thing I really want to talk about here is that um, Rip Jimmy Buffett, the New York Times described Jimmy Buffett in, his, in the obituary as a roguish bard of island escapism, hmm. which is just like kind of a delightful moniker. Yeah, shout out to whoever wrote that. Also, you know how like um, one of the secrets in journalism is that people just uh, write obituaries for people that they think might die soon so that once they die, they can just hit publish. Do you think that the New York Times had a Jimmy Buffett obituary pre-written. Oh, interesting. Okay, so he was 74. So I feel like the answer is maybe. Hmm. Was he, like, in bad health or something? I feel like that's... I really don't know. All I know is that when I was watching the Phillies game, they did have a moment of remembering Jimmy Buffett, even though he has nothing to do with baseball. I feel like, honestly, I feel like spiritually Jim, Jimmy Buffett had much to do with everything. Yeah. Um, I did see Guy Fieri do, like, a shout-out to Jimmy Buffett on Twitter. I love that. Which was very, rec- like, which was very game-recognized game of him, honestly. Mm-hmm. See, now I have to figure out the difference between Jimmy Buffett and Warren Buffett, a thing I had not previously done. What, what do you mean, the difference <laughs> between Jimmy Buffett and Warren Buffett? Sometimes what, I confuse one of these... who's who. I don't even have anything to say to that. What the fuck? What con... Okay. Yeah. Has this ever come up where you, like, say the wrong one and it actually causes a problem? Not that it causes a problem, but have I ever told my, um, my weird story of when I was in San Francisco and a generous friend was like, hey, do you want to come to this weird charity event that my wife is part of? And I was like... Honestly, going to a weird charity event in San Francisco and people watching sounds lovely. Um, The charity event was a bunch of people bidding via eBay. eBay was a sponsor on lunch with Warren Buffett. So it was just a bunch of people eating canapes and watching an eBay page refresh. That sounds very San Francisco. San Francisco is a terrible place. I'm sorry. Say that. I'm anti-San Francisco as I should be as an East Coast person. I think that... San Francisco is fun if you have money, but unfortunately, a lot of people don't have money. I think that's true about New York, too. Yeah, that's true about just existing. Yeah, but I feel like in Philly, you can have fun without, like... That's because Philly is a superior city. That's because New York is overrated. I agree with that. New York is very overrated. I would say that everyone should live here, except then the rents will go up. Yeah, so nobody should move there. New- you know what New York does have? Times Square Margaritaville. Yeah! You know that... Th- you know that that place is fucking lit oh, tonight. Yeah. You know that place is fucking the hottest club in New York City tonight. Truly, the hottest club in New York City is the Times Square Margaritaville. So I went there a couple weeks ago um, with, like, people, and it was honestly an incredibly surreal experience. Tell me about this. Okay, so, like, I mean, we went there, like, after getting drinks somewhere else, and it's literally, like, in the middle of Times Square. You walk in, there's an elevator, and, and the elevator... You ascend to Margaritaville, <laughs> and then basically you get there, and then it, it is fully Margaritaville, and you basically just kind of experience, like, being in a Margaritaville, but through the window you can see Times Square, which is just, like, a weird experience, because it's very, like, commercial suburban in the, in the Margaritaville way. Do you know what I mean? Like, there's, like, 15 million types of margaritas, and they all kind of suck. What kind of margaritas did you get? I don't remember. It was, like, something berry-flavored, and I thought it was too sweet. Um, we got that, and we got, like, fries and stuff, and it was all extremely regular bevies and I'm food. I'm still so upset about when I was supposed to stay at the Times Square Margaritaville for a journalism conference, but then it got delayed because of COVID, and then they actually had us stay at just, like, a random hotel instead when they rescheduled it. Honestly, you you could have lived the dream. You could have woken up in paradise. Cheeseburger in paradise. Exactly. You know what else is just like objectively fucking insane shit that's happening right now? <laughs> fucking Burning Man. Yeah, we have to preface this by saying that we're recording this. Uh, it is now 10.56 p.m. on Saturday, September 2nd, Eastern 
standard time. We don't know if uh, when this comes out, will people have died? Will this not be... Um... Yeah, we don't know if people are dead yeah, we don't. We don't people know if people die, die in the next, like, five days. We're recording this in the pre-death period. We hope that there is no death. But if there is, it is a pre-death period. There was a bad storm during Burning Man. Burning Man is happening right now. And 70,000 people who are there are told that they need to conserve their food and water because there's no way in or out right now. Right, because um, it is quote-unquote an undrivable mud pit. We really are on trend because right now on my trending topics on Twitter, it is Burning Man, One Piece, R.I.P. Jimmy. See, we're fucking covering all of our bases. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you want your pop culture, like, right up to the minute, aka five days behind. Wow, true. That's where you need to be. Um, but yeah, no, like, honestly, it's it's actually really fucked up with Burning Man, because it's very much like, yep, airport shut down, gate shut down, the burns are canceled, um, everyone is sheltering in place, you're supposed to be conserving resources, which is like, it's a very interesting situation to be in for something that is supposed to be like, oh, let's create as like a self-sustaining city for like two days. And it, it might rain, it might rain more. So, yeah. Do you think Burning Man is a good thing? Like conceptually? Or I guess maybe, not even conceptually. Conceptually, I feel like it's fine. I mean, I've always thought it was a little chuggy in the sense that you're spending a lot of money to um, live badly. And, like, if you want to do drugs and have sex, um, there's a lot of other ways people do that. You can do that in your real life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can do that in safer conditions. But also, like, I feel like my hot take about Burning Man is that I feel like people go there to experience, like, controlled chaos. Do you know what I mean? Where it's, like, people who live very safe lives who want to experience, like, a, like, some degenerate bullshit. Those people should just go to college. Ay. Ay. Um, we are we are clearly Burning Man haters, which is gonna be um awkward when in two days it's like, yep, a bunch of people died at Burning Man, and it'll be like, ooh, maybe we shouldn't have said that. I just yeah, it's just really absurd, but also kind of scary, because like I want these people to be safe, but also just the idea of like I feel like Fire Festival was funny because it was a bunch of like rich people that were being dumb and then dealing with the consequences of their dumbness and no one actually got hurt but this is like people could actually get hurt there's seventy thousand people there they're not all like influencers like some of them are probably just random people that like don't have an outlet for like places to be weird so they spend money to go to burning man because they don't have any friends in their normal lives that are weird with them yeah, I mean, I also think that, like, with Fire Festival, it was very much like, oh, yeah, people can, like, leave. Whereas this one's, like, people are all trapped in the pit. Could they leave at Fire Festival? I think they could. Also, B Billy McFarland is trying to do Fire Fest 2. Yeah, he's trying to do Fire Fest 2. We do need to talk about I that. Kind of, I kind of wanted to go for journalism, and then I was like, I deserve better. Justice for Amanda. We should add Billy McFarland back to the chat. We had him in one of the ETC group chats oh, for a no. while, and then he left. I'm glad that he... He didn't actually post anything. This was because you could, like... This was in a time when you could, like, just add people to chats without their consent. And if they didn't notice... Yeah, like Martin Shakur. Yeah, we did that with... Yeah. Um, I think we did it with Firefest Guy. I might be mi mi mixing, up, mixing him up with someone else. We had Shinzo Abe, former <laughs> prime minister of Japan, for, like, years. Oh, no. Like, his official account. <sighs> I'm honestly worried about the Burning Man situation. It's just... He's like, listen, they'll probably be fine. I don't I know, I feel man. like there's going to be so many TikToks, but also how are these people charging their phones? You know, in some ways, I feel like Burning Man is actually better prepared for this than, like, other, like, shit shows would be. Because, like, you do have to bring all your shit with yeah, you, you Yeah, and they do have people with life skills. Like, I feel like the people that go to Burning Man are people that go camping. Yeah, like, the people who go to, go to Burning Man are the people who are prepared to, like, set up a life for like some amount of time in in the middle of a desert. Do you know what I mean? Like you you're there in the desert alone for a bit with your your compatriots. And now they're in the mud pit together with their compatriots. Glad I'm not there. 
Yeah, so glad I'm not there. Instead, I'm playing Baldur's Gate in apartment. Love that. Yeah, instead I am in my podcast dungeon and experiencing legitimate mental health distress due to the Philadelphia Phillies, and specifically Aaron Nola. I can't help you with that one, man. You're gonna have to get through that yourself. See, my problem is the fucking clown. (laughs) (laughs) We got the clown from One Piece, we got Aaron Nola, we got Burning Man, we're doing great, and on that note... (laughs) <laughs> wait no that was so depressing we can't end on that no i'm gonna i'm gonna real quick my Baldur's gate character is a storm sorcerer i'm playing my first D D character oh. i'm pretending that he's on a weird little adventure away from his friends because he got yoinked by the the mind flayer ship and he has his cell phone and he is texting them with every update like guys there's a worm in my brain i fucking hate this and guys the vampire's trying to kiss me and can, can I kiss the vampire back? He's asking his boyfriend. They're an open relationship, so he can kiss the vampire. Isn't isn't there, like, explicit sex in Baldur's Gate? You can see so much dick in Baldur's Gate. And on that <laughs> note... <laughs> if you like this episode, tell a friend. Word of mouth is how we grow. Thank you to all of our patrons. And shout out specifically to Zoe, Brea, Drama, Thea, Brian, Gabriel, Lada, Matt, Max, my sugar daddy, Sam, and Aaron's husband. If you want your name in the above or in our Twitter header, slide right into our Patreon at patreon.com slash wildtrue. Shout out to audio editors Allison Mills and David Newtown, graphic designer and Canva Warlock, Eric Silver, who made our logo, Sam Reiser, who made our podcast music, and Tessa Farrow, who is transcribing our episodes. You can find us on Twitter as at wildtruepod and Instagram and Facebook as at wildtrue. Had your 15 seconds of internet fame, slide right into our Twitter DMs and tell us about it. And until next time, let's get weird on the internet. Hey, do you think we're going to have to start saying slide right into our XDMs? <laughs>